Okay. Um, welcome to the uh, fourth and final uh, speaker in the inaugural uh, Pitt Family Foundation speaker series for uh, the spring of 2021. It has been a wonderful uh, inaugural season uh, with Eddie Glau Jr., Ezra Klein, Lawrence Lessig, and tonight, Janet Napolitano. Um, as most of you know, uh, this series has been put together to address, have speakers come and address the 21st ch century challenges of a divided citizenry, to provide our community and our students with foundational tools for to build and strengthen our democratic institutions, to study the potential causes and solutions to unreasonable partisanship and extremism, and to educate and develop leaders across all disciplines. Uh, I am so pleased that tonight uh, we have as our closing speaker, uh, Janet Napolitano. Uh, before I introduce her, uh, I do wanna say that if you have questions, uh, put them in the Q&A. Um, uh, Janet has indicated that she will probably speak 25, 30 minutes, and then we should have plenty of time for questions. Um, in thinking about what I wanted to say about our governor uh, tonight, we've had wonderful speakers who have great theory and great thought uh, and are really the thought leaders in our country. Tonight, we have not only a very strong intellectual, but we have someone who's actually done all this kind of work. Uh, Janet Napolitano is currently uh, a professor of public policy at the Goldman School of Public Policy at the University of California, Berkeley. She served as the 20th president of the University of California and was Secretary of Homeland Security from 2009 to 2013. She, of course, is a former two-term governor of Arizona, a former Attorney General of Arizona, and a former U.S. Attorney for the District of Arizona. Um, Janet wrote a book, I'm gonna say two years ago, called How Safe Are We? I would recommend it to all of you. I can tell you, I read it probably in February of 2020. And there was this incredibly silly passage about how the one Homeland Security threat we had not addressed at all was that of a global pandemic. And I was like, okay, what's she talking about? And not 30 days later, we all learned just how unprepared we were and how much that uh, there was some awareness at the very top, maybe not getting the attention it should have, that this was a threat. Tonight, Janet is gonna provide her wisdom and expertise on better understanding and addressing the ever-growing threat of extremism. Again, an issue she was probably a decade ahead of on people and trying to get people to recognize it. Uh, she'll address uh, uh, some of the origins uh, and why we are so polarized uh, and why it's led to the extremism it has, but also what we can hopefully do to combat this grip of polarization and collectively what we can do as citizens to confront and defeat the rise of extremism. Uh, with that, it is my pleasure to uh, give the audience, uh, Janet Napolitano. Janet. Well, very good. Thank you, Jonathan. And um, it's, a, it's a pleasure to be with you tonight uh, uh, to address this topic. You know, when I was originally approached about giving this talk, uh, I, I thought, well, I can talk about a number of issues affecting our nation's security climate change, cybersecurity, emergent technologies. Uh, but uh, I've chosen instead to focus my remarks on 
the rise of violent extremism, uh, primarily but not exclusively uh, right wing uh, violent extremism. Uh, uh, as we saw illustrated by the insurrection on January 6th of this past year. But really, the United States has a long history of violent extremists operating within its borders. Just in recent decades, in the 1980s, we had uh, a group known as the Earth First Movement, uh, uh, one of their, their tactics was to go into the forests um, in Arizona and elsewhere, uh, and they would put uh, bolts into the trees so that when the loggers came to cut the trees down, their saws would hit the bolts and uh, fly back up, in, in some cases causing uh, serious injury. We had on April 19th, 1995, the Oklahoma City bombing where, where the Murrah Federal Building in Oklahoma City uh, was uh, destroyed. Uh, 168 fatalities, 19 of whom were children. That case was my first personal experience handling a, a matter involving extremism. I was serving as the US attorney for Arizona at the time. And I remember uh, about 5.30 uh, in the morning, I got a call uh, from the deputy attorney general of the United States, Jamie, Jamie Gorelick. And she said, we've caught the bomber. He did all of his planning in Arizona. You need to have a command center up in Kingman by close of business today. So um, I got in touch with the special agent in charge of the FBI in Arizona. Uh, we located the uh, National Guard Armory in Kingman. Uh, we moved agents up there uh, and some of the uh, prosecutors from my office. By the end of the week, it was the site of the 10th largest FBI office in the world. Uh, and in point of fact, the bomber, uh, Timothy McVeigh, uh, uh, did all of his planning in Kingman, Arizona. Uh, um, he did it or, uh, with his uh, friend, Michael Fortier. Uh, we persuaded Michael Fortier to uh, help and be a cooperating witness against McVeigh. Uh, in the end, um, 48 uh, got 20 years. Uh, Timothy McVeigh has since uh, been executed. Uh, but that was a vicious, uh, vicious crime. Uh, and um, uh, a, an illustration of how destructive extremism can be. Uh, we've had in our country various militia groups uh, in Arizona, particularly in the northwest corner of the state, in places uh, like rural Michigan, uh, but uh, they, they have been with us um, for a long time. Those cases, by the way, are primarily investigated by the FBI or sometimes the ATF if uh, firearms violations or explosives are concerned and prosecuted either through Maine Justice in Washington, D.C. or by uh, the relevant U.S. Attorney, uh, Attorney's Office. The effect of 9-11 uh, was profound in so many ways. Um, it was uh, the first time that the continental United States had been uh, attacked, over 3,000 fatalities, taking down the World Trade Center, hitting the Pentagon, uh, and a plane aimed at the Capitol that was diverted by its passengers to crash land in Shanksville, Pennsylvania. But uh, uh, that attack, um, 
uh, caused a, a number of things to, to happen. Uh, one was that the FBI turned its attention from domestic groups uh, to uh, the investigation of uh, terrorists who could come to the United States from foreign lands. Uh, another change uh, was that we had the passage of the Patriot Act. Uh, the Patriot Act, among other things, um, uh, increased uh, foreign surveillance powers uh, of the federal government. It created a new uh, crime, uh, that of providing material support uh, to a foreign terrorist organization. Uh, leaving uh, the phrase material support uh, uh, undefined. Uh, and then of course, uh, in the aftermath of 9-11, we had the creation of the Department of Homeland Security. And le let me explain uh, DHS. Uh, DHS was the combination of 23 different agencies that had formal, formerly come from legacy departments. They'd come from the Department of Transportation, the Department of Justice, the Department of Commerce, uh, uh, to give but a few examples. Uh, and then within DHS, uh, you had the creation of its own intelligence and analysis uh, uh, department uh, you had the creation of a division focused on protection of the nation's critical infrastructure. Uh, and you had uh, the creation of the TSA uh, because aviation security was uh, such a predominant concern in the aftermath of 9-11. Uh, the department was charged with myriad responsibilities, uh, including the protection of the air, land, and sea borders of the United States, the Coast Guard, of course, as part of DHS, the protection of the nation's critical infrastructure, the enforcement of the nation's immigration laws, um, and uh, emergency uh, response and recovery. FEMA, of course, is part of DHS. The end result is a mammoth department. It is now the third largest department of the federal government, close to half a million employees uh, throughout the United States, but also in countries uh, around the world. There is uh, some critique that uh, the nation uh, uh, over-responded, uh, overreacted uh, to 9-11. Uh, there was a GAO report in 2017 that said that the number of violent extremist attacks on American soil resulting in death since 9-11, there were 23 committed by radical Islamist extremists and 62 by right-wing extremist groups. Uh, so um, now, of course, uh, it looks like the balance may be going the other way in terms of law enforcement um, and intelligence response. Now, the increase in right-wing extremism uh, in, in the recent past, you know, it's easy to attribute it to the election of Donald Trump. But correlation is not the same as causation. Trump may have uh, been the match, but the fire already had been set. There are lots of factors that uh, scholars have identified as leading causes of right-wing extremism in the United States. Growing income inequality and lack of social mobility leading to whole uh, groups in the population 
living really without hope uh, and uh, uh, feeling like they are just stuck, that, that nothing the government can do can help them. Uh, in fact, the government actually hurts them uh, and uh, they, uh, in, in some, and, and, and then they become uh, radicalized. And I wanna talk about the process of radicalization in a moment. Uh, another factor that scholars have attributed the rise of right-wing extremism to is the growth in social media. You know, uh, the business model of social media is designed so that people stay online longer, meaning uh, that it's designed so uh, that you read something uh, on your computer or on your phone. And that links to another something that links to another something that links to another something. Pretty soon you can be down a rat hole. Uh, and uh, the material is designed to interact with you with your vision and your brain, et cetera, to keep you on your device for as long as possible. We've had the rise in misinformation on uh, uh, social media uh, and conspiracy theories on social media. So um, take, for example, QAnon. I venture to say that 18 months or so ago, most of the people in this audience never heard of QAnon but now it's in the common lexicon. And the QAnon conspiracy theory is really pernicious. It, it, it is uh, uh, based on the uh, misstatement, um, the misinformation that uh, uh, Democrats uh, primarily are uh, uh, a group of uh, sexual predators and pedophiles, uh, and they are a product of the so-called deep state. Uh, uh, the QAnon conspiracy led to a shooting at Comet Pizza in Washington, D.C., um, where uh, the shooter um, believed that this pedophile conspiracy was located uh, at this pizza place. One other factor that has led uh, uh, to right-wing extremism uh, has been the fact that, th again, through social media, a radicalized solo actor can feel like they are part of a group. Uh, and uh, act out accordingly. Uh, it's a way of connecting socially isolated individuals, primarily but not exclusively uh, young males, uh, um, and uh, through the, 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 the business model of uh, the, the internet and social media, uh, and through the misinformation uh, that is overladen there, uh, they become radicalized to the extent of wanting to commit acts of violence. But in addition to solo actors, we've had an increase in the number of groups, uh, the Proud Boys, the Oath Keepers, the three percenters, uh, um, all uh, groups that uh, believe that uh, the America they live in is not the America they want. Uh, um, race theory comes into play here. White supremacy comes into play here. We've heard in recent weeks of the so-called white replacement theory. Uh, uh, that is the, the, the theory that the 
white population of America is being replaced by people of color and people from foreign lands. Um, it's, it's really uh, just another definition, in my view, of white supremacy. We've had, um, an, although former President Trump uh, was not the cause of the increase in, in uh, right-wing extremism, uh, uh, he certainly uh, didn't discourage it. Uh, and a number of his statements and tweets, in a way, gave permission from the highest office in the land for adopting these right-wing beliefs. And we all recall, for example, the incident in Charlottesville, uh, where um, there was a march uh, down the lawn at the University of Virginia. Uh, uh, by individuals, um, some uh, carrying signs that were anti-Semitic, uh, some carrying signs that were uh, pro the KKK, um, uh, all, uh, many of them uh, in bullet vests and uh, carrying weapons. Uh, and when there was a counter protest in which one of the counter protesters was murdered um, by an individual who drove a car into the site of the counter protest, uh, President Trump said, well, there were good people on both sides. Well, there weren't good people on both sides. The president was heavily criticized for that statement, but the statement was indicative of how he approached uh, some of these extremist beliefs and extremist groups. He gave permission for them. I already uh, commented on uh, the white replacement theory, um, uh, but uh, that ties into the next factor that's uh, helped contribute to the rise of extremism Commentators like Tucker Carlson, who um, uh, has the highest viewership, I think he's finally surpassed Sean Hannity, uh, of the right-wing commentators on uh, uh, television on Fox News. And uh, Fox News, I must say, does bear some responsibility here. Uh, as do now alternative news uh, networks, uh, Newsmax and OAN, uh, to give two examples. So we've had this kind of unhealthy stew brewing that's a combination of uh, economic issues combined with social media, uh, combined with uh, uh, things on television, in the, in the TV media, uh, combined with uh, statements and tweets from uh, the president of the United States. That's what laid the fire uh, for uh, what happened on January the 6th. And what has laid the, the fire for the increase in right-wing extremism? Now, after 9-11, as I mentioned, uh, federal uh, intelligence and law enforcement agencies focused on Islamist groups uh, from ab abroad, Al-Qaeda, Al-Shabaab, groups of that sort. Uh, in 2009, when I became secretary of the Department of Homeland Security. We issued a report uh, calling out the rise of right-wing extremism as a growing problem in the United States. Uh, the report contained some language that uh, uh, military veterans uh, were ripe for recruitment by right-wing extremist groups. Uh, that language drew the ire of a number of the veterans organizations across the United States. Uh, they took umbrage. Uh, that caused members of Congress to take umbrage. I think I was called on to resign. Maybe I was called on to be impeached. 
Um, but the end result was that we had to withdraw the report. Uh, I apologize for that language. Then we redrafted it and re reposted the report. But nonetheless, it was indicative of that episode was indicative of how the United States um, was uh, not yet uh, appreciative of that very serious risk that we were seeing on the increase. Turning to the insurrection of January the 6th, uh, we're going to learn a lot more about right-wing extremism uh, uh, from the investigation and prosecution of the perpetrators of, of the insurrection. Uh, uh, I think we've already learned from the 400 or so arrests that have already occurred. Uh, more than 85% uh, are white males. At least 15% are military or law enforcement themselves. And we'll need to differentiate, um, and the prosecutors will need to differentiate between those who were bystanders uh, to those who were intruders, um, to those who committed acts of violence or violent acts against uh, Capitol Police. Uh, and as, as that process is, is underway and that onion gets unpeeled, uh, we're, we're going to learn a lot about the current state of right-wing extremism in the United States. You know, we've already seen uh, consequences. Um, and uh, the consequences uh, vary. Uh, one consequence was that the director of national intelligence was directed to assess the prevalence of domestic extremism, how it's organized, who conducts it, uh, what is its prevalence in American society today. That's a change for the DNI, because as I said, in the post 9-11 world, the focus was on uh, foreign terrorist organizations, uh, Al Qaeda, et cetera. We've seen deplatforming uh, uh, by Twitter and Facebook uh, uh, of the president of the United States. You know, when you think about it, that is a remarkable thing uh, to do, to um, cut off the leader of the free world from the major social media platforms that are out there. And, you know, that decision by those companies has been called into question as illustrative of the power that those uh, platforms have. Uh, but nonetheless, and, I, and I'm sure there were some tough balancing uh, uh, that had to be done, uh, the decision was, was made to uh, take him off the platform. Another consequence uh, has been the um, proposal that the United States actually adopt a statute against domestic terrorism. Uh, uh, you know, foreign terrorism, uh, uh, that's a federal crime. Material support to a foreign terrorist organization, that's a federal crime. But there's nothing in the statute books that speaks specifically to domestic terrorism. Now, um, uh, you might ask, well, how have those cases been handled before? And they've generally been handled uh, through uh, weapons cases, hate crimes cases. Uh, they've been kind of adjusted or morphed under existing uh, federal law. But the idea is that 
in this day and age, we need a domestic terrorism statute. You know, it's, um, and, I, and I say this as a former US attorney and attorney general um, and secretary of Homeland Security that uh, it might be time for such a statute in the United States, but I would call your attention to an article uh, by Rosina Ali in last Sunday's New York Times Magazine uh, about the cases that have been brought in the United States uh, under the existing uh, material support and foreign terrorist uh, laws on the books. And the um, theory of the article and the cases the writer uh, um, illustrates um, are cases of um, possible law enforcement overreach, uh, the overuse of uh, paid informants, um, the hyping of minor offenses uh, to uh, be uh, like the, the most major terrorist um, case ever. Um, and so if we are as a country to have a domestic terrorism statute, we need to be cognizant um, that there are risks uh, with, with having uh, such, such a statute. And uh, we really need to ask ourselves whether the existing body of federal law uh, is good enough or whether we need this additional uh, firepower in the hands of law enforcement. And finally, there's been the proposal of having a uh, nonpartisan, non 9 11 style commission. Um, you know, the original 9 11 commission's report is one of the most impactful reports ever produced. Uh, uh, by the federal government. And if you haven't read it, I recommend it, particularly the first 56 pages. It's compelling reading and um, uh, it helps illustrate all of the actions taken uh, in the aftermath of 9-11, including the creation of DHS. Uh, however, uh, we live in a hyperpartisan age, and the notion for a nonpartisan or a bipartisan commission has gotten tangled up in uh, really a fight between Democrats and Republicans in, uh, in Washington, D.C. Unfortunately, it seems unlikely that we will uh, have generated a report uh, of the type that the 9-11 Commission produced. And that's too bad because we learned a lot from the 9-11 Commission's work. Uh, and uh, as I mentioned, it was highly, highly impactful. And we have much to learn about what happened on January the 6th. And while the prosecution of those arrested will help us learn, as I've uh, mentioned earlier, um, uh, we could really do with a, a formal commission that really delves into um, the basis and the predicates for what happened on January the 6th. Let me conclude with a few thoughts. First, we really don't have a good predictive model uh, or even understanding for how someone actually becomes radicalized to the point of carrying out an act of violence. If we had such an understanding, if we had such a predictive model, we could do more to prevent acts of violence before they occur. We could do more to intervene, um, but as it is, uh, we basically are in a reactive mode uh, and, and so we need real research, in-depth research to help us better understand the phenomenon of radicalization. Secondly, 
We need as a nation to deal with the underlying conditions that have helped contribute to the environment where extremism can take hold. And I speak specifically um, to the economic uh, conditions uh, that uh, are contributing factors. Um, the notion of economic income inequality, the lack of social mobility. These are important things that as a country, to be a healthy country, we, we need to deal with. Third, we need to address the phenomenon of misinformation and misuse of social media uh, uh, and uh, how that then becomes exploited by some political voices uh, to contribute um, to the environment uh, leading to right-wing extremism uh, and uh, ultimately for some uh, to committing acts of violence. And I leave you, leave you with this thought before we turn to Q&A. Uh, and that is, um, as I began my talk, I, 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 I discussed how we've had extremist groups uh, from the far left and the far right uh, uh, for decades. Um, but we have not seen before the prevalence of these extremist groups. And we certainly have not seen before the kind of attack such as occurred at the Capitol on January the 6th uh, and until uh, recently. And once this extremist genie is out of the bottle, we're gonna have to focus on how we put the genie back in. And that will require the will and the political will and leadership from both sides of the aisle to accomplish. Thank you and, and I look forward to taking some questions. Okay, I'm back on screen in some respect. Um, uh, Governor, uh, I'll, I'll interchange titles. Um, I've got to say that the questions we already have in the Q&A are as uh, uh, provocative as any as we've had uh, so far and, uh, and challenging. So here we go. We'll just start you off with a big one. I, you probably have a pretty good opinion on. Should a DHS be abolished and its functions returned to other departments? No. Um, uh, DHS needs to uh, continue to evolve. I think it went backwards during the last four years, I must say, uh, in part because of a lack of constant leadership in the department. Most of the leadership positions, I think he, President Trump had six secretaries of Homeland Security uh, between President Bush and President Obama, there were a total of four secretaries of Homeland Security. Um, uh, it, it needs constant attention to uh, some of the, the balancing that needs to occur. For example, uh, the, the tension between law enforcement and civil liberties. Uh, the tension between the need to do surveillance and the right to privacy. Those always need to be taken into account and, and balanced. Uh, and then lastly, I think it's fair to, to say that under President Trump, the Department of Homeland Security looked like it was the Department of the Southwest Border, when in point of fact, its responsibilities are much greater uh, than the Southwest border. Uh, and um, uh, we, we need to have comprehensive immigration reform in this country. I've said it before and I'll say it again. Uh, and uh, it's just a, a, a gaping need uh, for us. 
Um, but nonetheless, um, uh, we can uh, 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 conduct our nation's immigration policy more in accord, not only with federal law, but with American values. And the department needs to return to that. But reorganizing the department, uh, splitting it up again, et cetera, uh, that's, that's just um, uh, greater, uh, in the end, it will be costly, it will be chaotic, and we will lose many of the advantages that having one unitary department give us. Okay, uh, Governor, you spoke really towards the end of your um, presentation about three things. I found it really good to start dealing with this in-depth research, addressing extreme economic inequality, and the misuse of social media. Uh, what kind of um, content limits do you feel could be placed on social media and how? So that's tough because the minute the government puts limits on content, that's a First Amendment issue. So in a way, uh, we have to rely on the platforms themselves to come up with a, with a mechanism to better uh, govern uh, the content that they have. So Facebook, for example, now, now has this outside uh, group. It's called the Supreme Court of Facebook. Uh, and one of their issues before them now is whether President Trump continues to be barred uh, by Facebook. Um, uh, but uh, we're going to have to rely uh, right now, I believe, on, on the platforms themselves and, and their owners and operators to uh, better govern the content that's contained therein. Um. You had mentioned it early on with regard to the report you put out and then had to draw back and uh, report again. That was some years ago. Do you believe today there is a connection or a strong connection between right wing extremists and some of the milit and some in the military and law enforcement? And if so, why? I mean, you, you were a law enforcement officer yourself in a way. Uh, What's your view of that today? Well, I think it's a problem. Uh, uh, I think the Secretary of Defense himself recognized it as a problem. He had the entire military stand down uh, last week for a day of lectures and discussions about extremism uh, and the dangers of extremism. Uh, and I think uh, uh, our law enforcement organizations need to con uh, consider doing uh, something similar. Uh, as I mentioned, there's a not insignificant percentage of the insurrectionists of January the 6th who were either uh, um, active duty or recently retired law enforcement and who were military veterans. Uh, and so um, there clearly is an issue there and, there, and they are um, prize recruits um, because of their training in weapons and uh, for many explosives uh, and military style tactics. Um, and so uh, it's not a surprise that we, we see them being targets for recruitment. So we, we need to better um, educate and empower our military and law enforcement officers so they can resist the lures of extremism and uh, uh, behave consistent with uh, law and our country's values. Well, as I expected, the questions are now pouring in. So we'll get to as many of them as we can in the time we have. We probably won't be able to get to all of them. So I'll, I'll probably try to go to the most provocative. Uh, are you aware of anything uh, that was done to discourage the FBI from investigating uh, extremism during the previous administration or anything suppressed by DOJ during that time with respect to domestic terrorism? Um, I'm uh, not aware of any explicit direction in that regard. Um, I think 
uh, a critique could be made, however, uh, uh, that the FBI was um, still focused on foreign terrorist organizations uh, and um, really only uh, since uh, the events of January the 6th have they uh, expressly, um, uh, you know, emphasized um, or put more resources into domestic extremism. The, the plain fact of the matter is where extremism is concerned, we need to be able to walk and chew gum at the same time. Uh, we still have threat streams that emanate from foreign terrorist groups. Uh, don't get me wrong. Uh, uh, but we do have this increase in domestic extremism. And so we're going to have to be able to, to deal with both phenomena. Okay. Um, I have, ah, a question about um, the prevalence of weapons in this country uh, and the role that easy access to weapons and automatic weapons play. Do you think that plays a role in what we're seeing and, and what's, your, what's your view on that? Well, it, it, it's a mystery to me why the United States can't uh, find its way to adopting some sensible uh, gun safety um, measures. Uh, um, universal background checks, uh, seem to me uh, a no-brainer. Um, why that is a third rail uh, amongst our politicians, uh, you, you've got me. Uh, um, uh, restricting the sale of ghost guns, guns that uh, come through the mail that don't have serial numbers so they can't be traced, that's a no-brainer. Um, and um, I don't think the, the Second Amendment really speaks to that. Uh, but, you know, we, we've gotten to a place where anything that has the word gun in it automatically by a large proportion of uh, our populace and our elected representatives uh, believe that anything having to do with guns is basically barred by the Second Amendment. I think that's an extreme view of the Second Amendment. And I think it gets in the way of having a safer country. Um, and uh, you know, I, uh, it remains to be seen um, uh, whether this Congress, the current Congress, uh, can pass any gun safety legislation. But right now, I'd say uh, there's not 60 votes in the Senate to do it. So uh, we're kind of stuck. Question, and, and, and I think you referenced left uh, extremism but most of the focus was on right-wing extremism. Any views about Antifa or BLM and whether they fall into that category or what role they play in uh, this idea of uh, domestic political extremism? Yeah, I think uh, there's a false equivalence that's being used here. Um, Antifa is, is, is not really an organization. Uh, it's um, uh, individuals who have a particular uh, set of uh, beliefs and a modus operandi, um, 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 but uh, uh, to my uh, knowledge, um, there was no Antifa in involvement um, in the insurrection. Uh, same with Black Lives Matter. Black Lives Matter is a powerful social movement uh, that uh, arose uh, this summer after the murder of George Floyd. Uh, and um, it, uh, uh, that murder caused um, demonstrations in cities throughout the United States. 95% of them were totally peaceful. Uh, and unfortunately, a, a few, um, there were a few uh, that got out of hand. Uh, but uh, Black Lives Matter is not an organization that uh, focuses on 
uh, violent activity or planning uh, violent activity. Uh, uh, to the contrary, uh, it renounces uh, that sort of thing. So uh, uh, to create an equivalence between Black Lives Matter and the Proud Boys or the Oath Keepers or the Three Percenters, uh, it just doesn't equate to me. Uh, what role do you see, or would this be another path forward for a stronger mental health community or a stronger mental health uh, safety net to try to help face some of these issues? Oh, for yes. Um, and, uh, you know, as, as I mentioned in my talk, um, we need a better understanding of the brain uh, that causes someone to uh, go from reading websites to going down the rabbit hole to becoming radicalized to the point of violence. Uh, and we need that better understanding so that uh, uh, we can do earlier interventions. And by that, uh, what I would mean uh, uh, would encompass mental health interventions. Um, uh, and uh, we have a pretty, um, uh, uh, how do I want to say it? it, it our, our mental health uh, uh, structures in this country need to be stronger overall uh, uh, for all of those who uh, need those services. Um, but I think there's a particular application for those who are in the process of becoming radicalized. I'm, I'm going to switch a little, maybe a lighter subject, maybe not. Uh, bring you back to your Arizona roots. These are three questions that I think I can put into one. Um, one, uh, kind of your view of the current Arizona legislative majority and uh, governor and their approach to governing. And at the same time, because this has been a front page significant issue in our state, uh, the challenge of uh, the role of uh, trying to purge early voting lists. And in fact, I think today I saw that a bill to restrict the early voting lists actually had, was voted down by the legislature. Uh, but your view of uh, our current state of Arizona politics, particularly as it relates to some of these voting bills. Right. So, I, I, you know, I, I try to follow Arizona politics. I'm in California now, so um, I'm not as uh, up to speed possibly as I, I should be, but I do try to follow. Um, and uh, the controversy I've been following is uh, the legislature's um, uh, subpoenaing of all of the ballots. Um, uh, uh, for what purpose, I don't know, um, uh, to do a, a, another count. The count is done. Uh, uh, the returns have been certified. The electors have voted. Um, uh, uh, the election is a done deal. Um, why state resources are being spent on uh, such a, a, a matter uh, irregardless of really the authority of the legislature to have access to custody of those ballots, uh, I, I think it, it's just an exercise in ideology run amok. Yeah, All right, I'm gonna I'm gonna flip it right back to those uh, more international issues. Um, have our intelligence services found any evidence of Russian intelligence participation in the social media content driving extremism? And is anyone looking into that particular uh, angle? Right. I don't have access to intelligence the way I did when I was the secretary of DHS. Um, but I, I have to uh, presume uh, that um, uh, there is a lot of um, investigatory work being done uh, specifically uh, to that issue, which is the, uh, the presence of foreign actors uh, interfering um, uh, in our electoral process, uh, not by hacking votes, 
um, but by in a way hacking into the material on social media that uh, influence voter influences voters. Uh, and I think the, the Russians were involved in 2016. Uh, I, I have no indication that they didn't stay involved in 2020 and they're pretty and they're pretty good. Um, uh, uh, they um, have a, a, a good understanding of American politics and the American um, uh, polity and the American voter. Uh, and I think they have an increasingly sophisticated um, knowledge of um, how to manipulate social media to influence those voters. So um, yes, I think that as the 2020 election um, and, uh, it's, and the run up to that election gets um, uh, unpeeled uh, by our nation's intelligence agencies, uh, we're going to find uh, foreign actors there. And I, and I point specifically, but not exclusively, to the Russians. Um, these are good practical questions. Uh, when you've spoken with key people on both the Republican and Democratic sides of the aisle, and you had plenty of experience with that, have you found certain methods or language that are effective in bridging the partisan divide? That's a really good question. You know, what I have found that, that works for me is to approach questions um, honestly and forthrightly with um, short declarative sentences um, and, uh, and, and also demonstrating a willingness to say, well, on the one hand, this, well, on the other hand, that, and this is how I would um, uh, adjudicate between uh, those two choices. So, uh, um, and, you know, th there are people in Washington that um, are not so uh, ideological that you could have those conversations with. There are others who you, you really can't touch and, and you need to move on to somebody else. A um, little bit off topic, but not really, uh, particularly in the, in the realm of uh, Homeland Security. Um, do you see a future possibility of bringing the border wall down? And what would be the first steps needed to do that? Yeah, so that's a, uh, partially that's an engineering issue. How do you deconstruct what's been constructed? Uh, I, I think the, the first uh, priority needs to be uh, to um, stop construction of new sections of the wall uh, and to get out of the uh, eminent domain cases the government has brought against private landowners on whose lands uh, the wall was uh, designed to be constructed. Uh, uh, the extent to which you have to leave up the remaining portions of the wall. And, there, and then there's another question, which are portions of the wall that are partially constructed. What do you do with those? And uh, I know, uh, or what I've seen is that uh, a wall, the wall is being constructed over some protected lands in Arizona, causing great environmental harm. Uh, so I, I hope the new administration uh, devote some effort uh, to how to how to militate, how to mitigate against that harm, and how to um, how, how to recuperate from it. There, there's kind of a series of questions around capitalism and and uh, income inequality and, and the role that those play. And, and but, do you believe that corporations have a responsibility of working to? Uh, tame down this extremism? And uh, what, what do you see uh, the big corporations role or is there a role for them in this? So it's interesting. So um, uh, it's interesting to watch uh, how big corporations have responded to the voting law in Georgia. Uh, and you've seen some of the big uh, local the big companies that are located or headquartered in, in Georgia, Delta Airlines, Coca-Cola, uh, uh, 
you know, after the bill was passed, um, but uh, 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 take a stand. We're now seeing a battle uh, uh, in Texas. Um, I think that uh, big corporations uh, do have a role to play um, uh, when something as serious as legislation that um, uh, restricts voting rights um, is, is concerned. Um, I think, you know, we need to be uh, a little careful um, uh, because big corporations um, uh, Oftentimes, you know, their, their interests may not be the same as uh, what in the end is good public policy. But I think in, in this instance where voting rights are concerned, good public policy it, to me is clear. We should make uh, voting as easy and accessible uh, and accurate uh, as, uh, as we can. And uh, initiatives that are designed to restrict the ability of folks to vote, bad public policy, bad idea. Uh, and I'm glad some of these big companies are taking a stand. Uh, we probably have time for, I think, about three more questions. I'll try to group some as best I can. I know I'm not going to get to everybody. Um, how about the role of religious funda fundamentalism in the rise of extremism? Yeah, that's a topic that um, I think is also ripe for research. Um, uh, uh, there may be literature already on that topic, Jonathan, but I'm not aware of, uh, of, of any. Um, uh, but I, I do think that I would put that on my need to know more list. Okay. Uh, a whole series of questions, and I, I think you tried to address it to some degree, but it's always kind of where I end up anyway, too, is, you know, and there's different ways people have put it, you know, we've, you know, probably for 30 years, this is, you know, we've been leading up to this moment or where we are for the past 30 years, you know, maybe addressed in spurts, um, you know, how do we put the genie back in the bottle and what is your progno prognostication for the next five to 10 years as to how we might turn this thing back around? Well, I think um, uh, it's not like flipping the light switch. It's not on or off, it's a process. And it's, uh, I think uh, a process um, uh, uh, by which, um, the president uh, 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 does, does not implicitly or explicitly uh, support um, extremism. It's a process uh, through which we start seeing government work for all the people uh, and benefit um, all the people. Uh, and it's uh, a process by which we uh, gain better understanding, as I've mentioned several times this evening, about what causes someone to become radicalized to the point of violence, uh, so that we really have some predictors, predictive factors, and um, early intervention strategies that, that we can play. Okay, one last pretty tough question, and then two more fun questions, I suppose. Is it possible that right-wing extremist groups are purposely sending members into the military to gain access to special weapons and tactics training that would then benefit their groups? Yeah, I'm unaware uh, uh, of any efforts uh, on, on that score. Um, uh, uh, not to say that there haven't been some, but I'm unaware of any efforts in that way. Last couple questions. One, uh, do you have any plan to return to national politics? <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm busy now. I've established a new center at Berkeley, the Center on Security and Politics. We're focused on looking at the security issues arising from climate change, 
uh, from uh, cyber uh, security and emergent technologies and from election, election uh, interference. And uh, uh, we put uh, in a subcategory there the, the use of uh, misinformation and disinformation on social media in connection with elections. So uh, that's where my interests are, are now and that's what I'm focused on. Great. After a little more study of that, you'll be qualified for national politics. I mean, <laughs> uh, final question. This is this is a good and fun one. Are you going to write another book? <laughs> oh yeah, uh, I'm trying to think of what I want to write about, but um, uh, I had um, uh, I enjoyed the experience of writing my first one. How safe are we? Uh, Homeland Security since 9/11. Still available on Amazon. Uh, and um, I actually think um, uh, I might turn my attention to the security risks uh, associated with climate change. All right. All right. Well, Governor Napolitano, Secretary Napolitano, President Napolitano, Janet, uh, thank you so much for being with us this evening. Spirited set of questions and discussions and some great thinking for all of us to leave with. Uh, this, like the other presentations, will be on YouTube, uh, so you can watch it again or tell your friends about it so they can see it. Uh, and um, we look forward to seeing all of you next year. Uh, we'll have a whole summer this time to put together, hopefully, an equally luminous group. But uh, uh, Janet, I really do want to thank you again for being so gracious uh, and open with your time for the Tucson community. So thank you. Thank you. Go Wildcats. All right. <laughs> and, and that will conclude our uh, session. Uh, until next year, uh, have a good summer, everybody. Appreciate it. Thank you. <laughs>